Hello friends. As children, each of us has probably wondered who is stronger. A lion or a tiger? A shark or a crocodile? A brown bear or a polar one? As we grow up, however, we realize that there is absolutely no point in comparing them because each of them is good in their own way and each of them has their own advantages and disadvantages. Likewise, there is no point in comparing two premium automobile giants such as Bentley and Rolls-Royce. Even though Rolls-Royce produces few car models, that is exactly why each of them literally becomes a legend of its time. The outlines and the interior of these cars speak to the fact that their owners are very rich and they have nowhere to rush because they have long achieved all the things they wanted. As you must have already guessed, today we'll talk about Rolls-Royce. How did it all begin? How did an ordinary meeting of two enthusiasts forever change not only their lives, but also the lives of thousands of wealthy people around the world? Today, Rolls-Royce Motor Company Limited is a British company, a division of BMW AG, specializing in the production of luxury cars. Luxury, prestige, comfort and reliability. All these words describe each of the Rolls-Royce cars that have been produced for over 100 years. The story of Rolls-Royce Limited dates back to May 1904, when a British engineer, Henry Royce, had a lunch with a British aviator, race car driver, and owner of one of the first car dealerships, Charles Rolls. Henry's family didn't earn large incomes. Henry Royce was the fifth child in the family of James Royce, an ordinary miller who worked in a rented mill. Their financial situation was so bad that they even had to leave their home and moved to London in search of a better life. His father was the breadwinner of the family, and he found a pretty good job in London. However, after only a year at the new school, Henry had to mature fast. Unfortunately, Henry's father died in 1872, and the boy was forced to earn money by delivering newspapers and telegrams. He was only nine years old at the time. Left without a father, Henry had to learn everything on his own. Thanks to his good relationship with his aunt, the boy was able to get a job as an apprentice in a railway workshop, and it was there that the young man learned how various mechanisms worked and their structure. Later, the experience he got at this job helped Henry get a job at an electric company, but only as an ordinary electrician. And a bit later, the man moved to Liverpool. Royce did his job better than anyone else. He quickly made good acquaintances, one of whom turned out to be a like-minded genius, Ernest Claremont. Some few days after they met, they realized that they had the same dream, to create something of their own. But unfortunately, as it often happens, they simply didn't have the money for it. So they had been coming up with ideas for several years until they got enough money to start their own business. Thus, having saved up 20 pounds, Royce and Ernest Claremont launched the production of electrical equipment in 1884. Henry was only 22 at the time, and they started off by making electric doorbells. What kind of doorbells were they? They looked very simple, much simpler than their competitors, and their cost was almost twice as much, but they never broke. It was then that Royce came up with a proud formula. Quality is remembered long after price is forgotten. In 1894, they founded a company for the production of cranes, Royce & Company. Five years later, they listed its shares on a stock exchange and even built a factory in Old Trafford. By the way, the production of cranes designed by Royce continued even after his death, up until 1964. It was then that having saved up some money, Royce was able to buy his first car. It was a French one. However, after driving a De Dion for several years, the man realized that he was completely dissatisfied with its quality. As Henry himself later recalled, the car didn't meet its declared quality, and it broke down so often that he had to disassemble and reassemble the car himself. It was those frequent breakdowns and low-quality components that inspired the man to design his own car. In fact, it was at that moment that fate brought together Royce and Rolls, who was an equally inspired car enthusiast. As for Charles, he had a completely different story. He was into mechanical engineering since his youth, and he even studied it at the University of Cambridge. Moreover, he was the first student in his year to buy his own car and to begin participating in races. It should also be noted that he was fortunate to have been born into a wealthy family, which had always supported all of his initiatives. 
So, thanks to his connections and a favorable financial situation, the man was able to open a showroom selling foreign cars. Everything would have been fine if it wasn't for the suppliers that kept disrupting the delivery of cars and their components, or even failing to supply the needed components altogether. For several years, the man looked for a reliable partner, but let me remind you again that the year was 1904, and there were still many people who hadn't even heard about cars at the time. It had only been a year since Henry Ford launched his own production, which was quite small back then. So, Charles was having a hard time, having gone into this extremely challenging business all alone. But, as you have probably guessed already, it all changed when he met Henry Royce. Their first meeting was also very entertaining. It was Charles Rolls who sent the amateur engineer a telegram inviting Henry to come to London for negotiations. But he got a very surprising answer, saying, You want this meeting? You come over. And it should be noted that the Honorable Charles Rolls did take the trouble to come. They met on May 4, 1904, at the Midland Hotel restaurant. There's even a corresponding memorial plaque there now. Royce was 41 years old, and Rolls was 26. But apart from the age difference, there was also a class gap between them. One was a rich son from a wealthy family, and the other one was a regular man who had to work hard for his every achievement. Nevertheless, they did manage to get along. The men began their cooperation in early 1905, even though they signed the contract a year later. Soon, they presented the world with their very first cars they developed together. Thanks to good public relations, Rolls quickly informed the press that he was working on his own car, thereby fueling interest in the future launch. Besides, these men made a nearly perfect team. Henry Royce was a great engineer and could make quality cars, while Charles Rolls knew how to sell them. From the very beginning, all the roles in the company were distributed equally. Henry didn't go into sales and commerce, and Charles didn't interfere with Henry's creative process. This might have been one of the main secrets of their success. The founders of the company complemented each other perfectly. They named their company Rolls-Royce, and by the end of the year, they were already selling their cars. The first car they launched was the Silver Ghost, built at Royce's Cook Street plant in Manchester, which hit the road in 1907. It was originally powered by a 7,036cc six-cylinder engine, but it was increased to 7,428cc in 1909. The price for the new model, launched by the young Rolls-Royce company, was simply stunning. 985 pounds sterling, and it was only for a chassis with a motor. The customer, having spent almost a thousand pounds for the mechanism, had to pay the same amount for the body, about 2,000 pounds. This money was enough to buy a mansion in London. Nevertheless, the founders weren't about to lower the price. They used all the best and newest components in their cars, focusing on the car's quality, trying to distance themselves as much as possible from their unreliable competitors of that time, such as the French car manufacturers. And the car did find its buyers. The car had been produced until 1925 and was very popular among other drivers and even racers. However, the most interesting part was yet to come. It soon became clear that there wasn't enough money. After all, Rolls was one of five children in the family and his father was in good health and was in no hurry to leave an inheritance. They had to increase the number of shareholders to be able to afford a large plant in Derby which caused both Rolls and Royce to end up with few shares. Both of them became members of the first board of directors, taking their positions as the chief engineer, Royce, and a technical director, Rolls. The men understood that the largest and fastest growing market was overseas, and that is why, after the initial launch of their car, they headed to the USA in order to personally present their creation there. Something happened there, something that changed the history of the car brand forever. During the trip, Rolls met with the Wright brothers, the creators of the world's first airplanes. Soon, aviation took over Charles' heart so much that he began to take a great interest in flying. He quickly acquired all the necessary knowledge and skills, and a few months later, he was sitting at the controls of an airplane for the first time. He even managed to fly over the English Channel on his own. The way things were going, it seemed that Rolls would become engrossed in piloting. However, either by chance or intentionally, Aviation became another serious business of the new company. Having discussed all the details, Rolls-Royce developed the first aircraft engine, with Henry as the chief engineer. By the way, they're still being produced, and moreover, they're still considered the golden standard and the best of their kind. 
There is a common opinion that it was due to this production that Rolls-Royce managed to stay afloat during the First World War. The partners had many plans for the future. Who knows what the ordinary company would be like today if the situation hadn't changed drastically in 1910. One ordinary day, Henry Royce received some of the worst news of his life. Charles Rolls had died in a landing competition. At an altitude of about seven meters, his airplane's tail came off, thereby leaving the pilot no chance for survival. Thus, Charles Rolls became the first pilot to die in a plane crash in England. Charles loved being the first at everything and remained true to himself even in his death. Legend has it that it was a sign of mourning for Rolls that the board decided to paint black one of the R's of the Rolls-Royce logo. The minute the businessman died, Royce inherited all of the rights to the company, all the finances, as well as all its problems. Wartime became a period of stagnation in the automotive industry. However, even during this period, Henry Royce was trying to create something new that would keep the company, created by long and hard work of two enthusiasts, afloat. Thanks to his persistent efforts, Royce was able to open a factory in the United States in 1921. The R engine, which was used in seaplanes, was developed there. The plant, however, had only existed for five years before the sales started falling rapidly, since it turned out to be essential for American motorists to have a car assembled at the Albion. Another car was developed by Rolls-Royce in 1922. It was named the Baby, Rolls-Royce 20 horsepower. Considering the niche occupied by the manufacturer, the number of cars sold was counted in hundreds, not thousands, and it was very difficult to maintain the production of such volumes. So, having considered the development strategy, this car was created specifically for middle-class drivers, doctors, lawyers, and businessmen. It was equipped with a six-cylinder engine with a volume of 3,127 cc that could develop the speed of 99 kilometers per hour. The Silver Ghost was replaced by the first Phantom Series car, which was assembled both in the UK and in the USA. Only 3,463 of them were produced before the Phantom 1 was already replaced by the Phantom 2 in 1929. It was the first of its kind, accelerating to 120 km per hour. It had been produced until 1935, when it was replaced by the Phantom 3. This model was the last car of the pre-war period that was completely manufactured by the company. In 1931, Rolls-Royce acquired a portion of the assets of its rival Bentley, which was in a difficult financial situation. This purchase helped because Bentley cars had a well-established reputation of solid, expensive, and most importantly, reliable cars and limousines, thanks to which they were very similar to the Rolls-Royce cars. Thus, Henry Royce eliminated the main competitor. In 1933, Henry was already 70 years old and barely handling all his responsibilities. Nevertheless, he never left the post of chief engineer or stopped being the company's main inspiration. Henry Royce died on April 22, 1933. Back in 1911, while vacationing on the French Riviera, Royce fell seriously ill. A couple of months later, the man underwent a very complicated surgery for that time, which no one thought he would survive. However, Henry did survive, and he lived for another 20 years. He passed away a little before his 70th birthday, and it was then that the second letter on the logo turned black. But that's only a legend. Some people believe it, while others don't, since the timing of the color change doesn't coincide with the dates of the founder's death. The color might have been changed for much more trivial reasons, there were a lot of orders for Burgundy Rolls Royces, and red looks bad on Burgundy. After Henry's death, the main shareholders and the board of directors started managing the enterprise, but they were forbidden to deviate from the basic rules of car production, which Henry and Charles had prepared when they were still alive. As for one of the main symbols of Rolls Royce, the flying female figure, very little is known about it. Royce himself had always been against any mascots on his car. In his opinion, they ruined their design, their streamlining, and made the expensive cars feel cheap. However, he began to notice that drivers were often putting all sorts of things on his cars. Mascots in the shape of black cats, busty girls, and even men in obscene positions. So Henry gave up. It's better to stop this amateur initiative by coming up with something more suitable. That's another interesting story. 
One day, the editor of the car magazine, Sir John Montague, bought one of the Rolls-Royce cars for his personal use and commissioned sculptor Charles Sykes to make a special mascot for it. Looking for inspiration, the sculptor decided to visit one of the company's factories to personally see how each car was assembled. Sykes had been depressed for two weeks. One day, as he was about to decline Montague's offer, he suddenly fell in love with his secretary in the halls of his office. The girl's name was Eleanor Thornton. The exquisite, beautiful, impudent, and impetuous girl quickly sank deep into Sykes' mind. It was then that he realized what the mascot for Rolls-Royce should look like. The hood sculpture of Eleanor was called Whisper, as the girl had one forefinger pressed against her lips. The demand for the hood mascot kept increasing. At the same time, Sykes was commissioned to develop a universal symbol. His obsession with Eleanor was his inspiration once again. This time he depicted her in fluttering clothes, as if preparing to jump. This version was named the Spirit of Ecstasy and it has been invariably installed over the radiators of all Rolls-Royces since 1911. Each figurine has been cast by Sykes himself and his daughter until 1948, when the Rolls-Royce company took over the casting process. By the way, the sculptor's feelings for Eleanor were never mutual. The Second World War made certain adjustments to the development of the company and the pace of car production. But in 1949, the Rolls-Royce Silver Dawn was already launched for mass production, and a year later, another novelty of the automobile market, the Silver Cloud, was released. In the early 50s, the company began to produce the Phantom IV model, created specifically for the royal family and the top officials of the state. The main feature of the Phantom IV was that the car could be driven at a speed of a pedestrian for a long time. This feature was required for official ceremonies, during which the engine didn't overheat at all. The Phantom IV had been replaced by the perfect Phantom V, incorporating all the characteristics of the previous model. 1968 was marked by Rolls-Royce's launch of the Phantom VI. The car was produced exclusively in limousine bodies and was discontinued only in 1992. The 70s were a crisis period for the company, and in 1971 Rolls-Royce officially went bankrupt. It was the ordinary people of Great Britain, as well as the government, who saved the day. The government invested $250 million in the company. The first model to emerge after the crisis was the Rolls-Royce Cornish, a top-of-the-line coupe cabriolet that had remained on the market until 1995. From that time and until the 90s, cars like the Rolls-Royce Camagüe, Rolls-Royce Silver Wraith II, Silver Spirit and Silver Spur, as well as Park Ward had been produced. The company decided to celebrate its 90th anniversary with the release of the Rolls-Royce Flying Spur. There are only 50 of those in the whole world, and they were sold out in just two days. Unfortunately, the company didn't manage to stay afloat on its own. A huge number of cars were being produced in the world every second. Meanwhile, Rolls-Royce wasn't just a car, it was history and status. That same year, the German concern BMW took control over the company while the Bentley brand was passed into the ownership of the Volkswagen Group. However, this transition didn't stop the development of the Rolls-Royce brand in any way, and continues to hold the leading position in the luxury car segment, and is unfailingly popular with Hollywood celebrities and aristocratic families around the world. There have always been legends about Rolls-Royce, and most of them are true. So, for example, after being assembled, each car undergoes a test drive for 2,000 kilometers, after which it's completely disassembled and each of its parts is carefully checked. It is only after that that the body is painted and the final assembly takes place. After all, this car isn't meant for an ordinary worker, but for a royal person or a president. It's also interesting that they apply 12 layers of nitro paint, because synthetic paint doesn't give a sense of color depth. Each layer is polished before the next one is applied. Each hood mascot is also polished, and always with ground cherry pits powder. At the beginning of his journey, Henry Royce introduced a rule, which required every car to be built like a yacht, very carefully. Rolls clarified that it had to be made according to an individual project and to be adapted to each specific customer. He even came up with a slogan, There are no two identical Rolls Royces. Each element of decoration must be as perfect as the mechanism itself. For example, 
All glass parts need to be polished with a special pumice stone for optical lenses. But the most famous fact is probably that all Rolls-Royce cars are assembled only in the UK and only manually. The Goodwood plant has only two robots applying paint to the body. All other work is done by the hands of real professionals and enthusiasts. As for the Rolls-Royce aircraft engine division, they made a major contribution to the Great War because it was Henry's inventions that accounted for more than half of all Allied aviation. The planes with his motors crossed the Atlantic in 16 hours and were the first ones to fly from England to Australia. To this day, Rolls-Royce cars remain a symbol of taste and prosperity. Their quality is evidenced by the fact that until now, 60% of all their cars remain in working order, and at the same time, they are getting more expensive with each passing day. The company was created by two patriots of the automotive industry, two people devoted their hearts and souls to their work, which once again proves that people really need to love what they do. Friends, which car brand do you associate with luxury? Be sure to write it in the comments. Have you ever seen these cars in real life? Well, that's it for today. Like this video and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time.